quite a few. Uh, okay, uh, but uh, you know, from uh, talking to Florida birders, you don't know the difference. So that's all good. Uh, so here we go. Uh, I'm uh, my credentials. I guess I'm, I've been in Washington a long time. I'm, I'm on the WASP board, and I have a podcast. So I guess that's my credentials. Uh, oh, I next slide. Uh, winter Washington birding. Winter birding in Washington is really good. Uh, um, a lot of us think winter is the best time to bird in Washington. Uh, we get uh, a lot of winter visitors. Uh, a lot of birds from high elevation come down lower, and it's great birding. It's just you know tough to be here in the winter for the whole winter. It rains a lot. It's not very nice in terms of weather. Uh, so, but we get things like snowy owls and jeer falcons. Fairly, you know, you can find them if you go look for them. Next. Uh, is it the best place to go birding in the winter? Probably not. Uh, if you want to see great gray owls and northern hawk owls, you know, go to Minnesota. If, if you want to see uh, almost anything you can find in Washington, except for the real Northwest specialties, and maybe you could find better somewhere else. But if you're in Washington, uh, get out birding in the winter. It's a great place. Uh, there are good day and two day trips from both the east side around Puget Sound and Seattle. Uh, lots of good trips on the east side from either Spokane or Walla Walla or wherever you happen to be. Uh, in the winter, you can get most of the resident specialties, you know, the things you would have to go to the Pacific Northwest to find. You can get them almost all in the winter. Uh, and if you're sick of the nice weather, this is a good place to come. So <laughs> next. Uh, Washington, really, you can think of it as two states. Uh, a, a lot of the people in eastern Washington do think it should be two states. They want to be called Republic uh, and break off from Washington. But uh, that's a, an aside. Uh, if you if you look at Washington, uh, there's the eastern part of Washington, east of the Cascade, you see the big mountain range running down the middle of the state. That's the Cascade Mountains, Mount Rainier, and a bunch of other mountains that are fairly high. And you need to watch the weather reports uh, and traffic uh, cautions for crossing the passes in the winter. But eastern Washington is big, uh, two to 3,000 foot elevation and more in some places, plateaus uh, and uh, big open spaces. Uh, Western Washington is more your typical uh, rainy, uh, drizzly weather, uh, never gets too cold, never gets very warm, uh, but is uh, a great place for a birding also, especially on the coast can be really good. Uh, and around the Puget Sound, a lot of places too. So two states, uh, com really completely different uh, habitats. Next. Uh, uh, so in Western Washington, uh, you'll get almost all the typical Pacific Northwest residents that you might be looking for if, you, if you're a Floridian coming to Washington. Uh, but uh, we also get a lot of gulls, uh, vagrant gulls, uh, winter visitor gulls. We get a lot of raptors if you go to the right places. And there are places, uh, especially in Nia Bay and other places, to get some really good vagrants that we like to see, but a visiting birder would probably find them more where they're from. Eastern Washington, as I said, colder and drier. We have a lot of uh, introduced and resident uh, uh, grouse and partridges and, and some other specialties. But again, watch the, uh, watch the mountains to cross. Uh, winter birding in the mountains, unless you're some sort of a crazy mountaineer, not, not going to be for you. Next. Uh, Here's a list of some of the, the birds you might want to see in Washington if you're from another I place. Say, I thought there'd be. I won't spend time on these, just, just a list you can look at. And if you have questions about any of these uh, later, uh, just uh, let me know. Next. Uh, so in Western Washington, uh, some of the things that an out-of-state birder might like to look for, uh, loons, we get all of the loons here. Uh, sometimes we get uh, Pacific, uh, uh, Pacific uh, red-throated and common loons regularly. Uh, not in this breeding plumage in the winter, uh, but we also get yellow bill loons and a rare Arctic loon here. Uh, so it's a great place to look for loons. Gulls here are tough, and they're tough largely because of this gull. Uh, this is our Glaucus wing by Western uh, hybrid, uh, also called Olympic gulls, or most of us call, us call them big guys, uh, because they can look like almost anything and confuse you with almost any gull you want to try to identify. But they're the default large white-headed gull here in the winter. Next. Next slide, please. Uh, Western gulls are pretty easy to see on the coast. 
uh, and are not easy to see anywhere else in the state. So you really want to go to the open uh, coast to see western gulls there. Very common there, though. Glaucus wing gulls, uh, the bird on the right, uh, is uh, common here and more often seen in the summer. In the winter, we're just flooded by hybrids. Uh, so it's it, you can certainly find glaucus wing gulls, but finding a good one that really doesn't have any dark on the underwings and uh, and has the same color wingtips as the back and is you're confident as a real pure glaucus wing gull can be a challenge in the winter. Next. Uh, California gulls uh, breed in eastern Washington uh, are abundant here in the fall. We get huge, huge uh, flocks of California gulls on the coast and even sometimes inland uh, in September, you know, sometimes August, September, October, but a few over winter. So in the winter, you can find a California gull here. Sabin's gulls, more a fall bird, uh, so probably not in the winter. Next. Uh, uh, Bonaparte's gulls, uh, up until December, are pretty easy. After that, get a little harder, but you can find them in the winter here pretty regularly. Uh, Shirtville gulls are really only seen here in the winter and in big flocks. We get, you can't go out for a day without seeing shirtville gulls if you're anywhere near water, saltwater especially. Next. Uh, Herring gulls are found here regularly, although not, they're not common, and the Thiers race of the uh, Iceland gull is same. Uh, probably equally easy to find uh, or equally difficult to find, depending on how you think about it, but we get both of those in any uh, good flock of gulls in the winter. Next. Uh, Glaucus gulls. Uh, are regular here. Uh, there's almost always one around somewhere in the winter. You probably have to go looking for it. Ring bills, they're, they're here and there uh, in the right places. Next. Uh, uh, black legged kitty wakes, mostly on the coast. Uh, but uh, if you go looking for one, you can find one here in the winter. Hearman's gulls, uh, they're hard to find here in the winter. They're extremely abundant. Uh, from late summer through late fall, but probably by November or so, they're mostly uh, wandering back south down to the Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Mexico where they breed. Next. Hmm. So gulls, uh, I, I think, you know, East Coast birders really enjoy the diversity we have of gulls. Uh, my experience breeding on the East Coast is, you know, there's a few gulls, but not the big variety uh, that we have here. Alcids, uh, we have alcids here. I don't have good winter pictures of my alcids in general. This is a good pigeon guillemot on the left, looking pretty much in a winter plumage. Uh, and they are, they replace your black guillemots on the east and are, you know, you can find them easily. Uh, marble merlets uh, are one of our, uh, you know, people come here to find uh, pigeon guillemots, uh, go to Alaska to find them, uh, excuse me, marble merlets, go to Alaska to find them more easily. This is a breeding plumage. And for some reason, they're easier to get a picture of in breeding plumage. They kind of come in closer and they're feeding. Uh, in the winter, they tend to be farther out and, you know, harder to see there in a black and white plumage across in the winter. Marble murelets are a cool story. Uh, some, some of you probably know that uh, obviously they're an alcid and most alcids breed on uh, rocky islands, so usually off the coast or some in inaccessible areas on the coast. Uh, and they're young, just kind of flop off the flop off the ledge and, and go into the water. Marble murelets have adapted to breed in old growth forests and mature second growth forests maybe. Uh, and they breed 80 to, 80 to higher, 80 feet or higher off the ground on horizontal branches that are at least eight inches in diameter and are almost never found. Uh, nobody knew where they breeded for forever until uh, a large tree got cut down with a, a nest full of uh, chicks that were marble murelets. And they said, oh my gosh, they breed way out there. How can they be breeding 30 miles from the sea? But they do. They breed up to 30 to 50 miles from shore. And these birds, when these their first flight, the first flight of these marble murelet chicks is from the nest up to 50 miles to the ocean. Uh, so it's, it's shocking that any of them ever make it, but they do. And uh, they're pretty cool birds. Next. Uh, rhinoceros oclets, again, a, a breeding plumage pitcher. They're common here all year round, or relatively common, and they're doing well. Unlike uh, their pretty close relatives, the, the uh, tufted puffin, uh, they are increasing in numbers. 
while uh, the puffins are decreasing numbers. Puffins are hard to find in Washington, even in the summer, you have to go to special places and they're way out at sea in the winter. Ancient murrelets can be found here in the winter, but I don't have a decent picture, uh, but they're another target bird for birders to come out here. Uh, I think, yeah, we skipped one here somehow. Uh, getting to the woodland birds, most of those are the Pacific Northwest specialties, birds that people come to this area to find, chestnut-backed chickadee. Uh, you have to get north of Northern California to see those. Red-breasted nuthatches are pretty easy to see, uh, red-breasted nut, red-breasted uh, sapsuckers are pretty easy to see here. Uh, it's hard to go find one, but if you're out a while, you'll just come across one somewhere. Uh, you know, they're, they're pretty easy. Bewix wrens replace Carolina wrens here. They're our garden wren, they're all over the place. Uh, seen fairly often and heard almost always. Pacific wrens replace your winter wren. You know, not too long ago, they were split from uh, winter wren. And they are, you know, quite common. Uh, they got a nice little uh, kiss note that you can hear. And if you look hard, you can find them. They're, they're not hard to find at all. Next. Uh, Hutton's vireos uh, are always hard to find, except in breeding season when they're singing, uh, but they're around all the time. And if you look hard, you can find one. Uh, Stellar's jays are not hard to find. They are the, the equivalent of the East Coast blue jay. They're just all over the place, loud and uh, easy to find. Next. Uh, Shorebirds, in the winter, we don't have uh, a big variety of shorebirds here. But the, the things you might want to come to the area to find, especially, are usually here in the winter. Uh, black oyster catchers are uh, easily found in the right place. They're only in a few places. You have to know where to go, but, but it's not hard to find black oyster catchers. Uh, same with black turnstones, you need a rocky substrate. But if you go to the right places, they're pretty common and easy to find. Next. Rock sandpiper, uh, never easy to find, but they're regular at certain places. You can almost always find them at the jetty at Ocean Shores, for example. Uh, Western sandpipers are not common here in the winter. I don't have a good winter picture. They're in their basic drab gray plumage in the winter uh, and can be confusing to identify if you, if you don't go by structure. Uh, but uh, they're, they're found uh, in small numbers along the coast and other places and in migration because spring and fall are abundant. Next. Uh, waterfowl, you know, most of the waterfowl we have are, are inland breeders. They, they breed in the pothole lakes all over the, the northern tier of the US and Canada, uh, but come down lower and around here in the winter. Uh, cinnamon teal might be a bird you'd wanna find. Winter is not a great time to find them. You can find one if you chase it somewhere probably. They're common in, in, the, in the spring and occasional in the fall. Uh, and just, I'm not gonna go through all the ducks, pretty much almost all the dabbling ducks you can find anywhere else you can find here. Uh, diving ducks too, of course, like uh, Burroughs Goldeneye. Next. Uh, swans uh, are fun. Uh, they're big, white, beautiful. Everybody loves to see swans. And we have both uh, trumpeter and tundra swans here uh, easily found. Tundra swans tend to be more in Southwest Washington. Trumpeters are the default swan almost everywhere else. Trumpeter is one of the great conservation stories in the last uh, you know, 50 years or so. They've made a huge comeback after getting rid of lead shot and uh, not hunting so much. So trumpeter swans are everywhere. Next. And we've had a treat the last couple of years with, with uh, hooper swans. Uh, this, I took this picture just uh, maybe a week or two ago, less than an hour from where I live in Tacoma. So there's a hooper swan around if you want to come get it right now. Uh, next. Uh, Falcons, uh, excuse me, fal raptors are uh, always fun. And we have a nice variety of raptors here in the winter, uh, at least nice variety for the northern part of the US. Uh, you can get all of the falcons here. Uh, the Skagit and Samish Flats, which are only about an hour to an hour and a half north of Seattle, depending on traffic. Uh, you can get all of the, uh, the regularly occurring falcons there on a really good day. Deer falcon is always tough. Prairie falcon is not easy on the west side, but they're most winters, all five of them are around, and so you have a chance. One year we had a Eurasian uh, kestrel, so we had people had six falcon days. They were pretty excited about that. Uh, but the reason people who aren't necessarily birders go to the Skagit and Samish Flats is to see the eagles. The salmon run at the Skagit River 
brings in hundreds and hundreds of bald eagles. So you can see trees with 50 or 60 bald eagles in them uh, pretty easily. It's always kind of exciting. Next. And the, the trumpeter swans are all over the place, the Skagit and Samish Flats, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And uh, the big flock of snow geese comes from Wrangell Island, uh, uh, island up it, off of the coast of Russia. It's a, a big flock, sometimes 30, 50,000 birds, pretty exciting to see spread out over a field. You, we scan through looking for a blue goose and, and occasionally find that. Uh, but they're always fun when you see the snow goose up and flying. They're just uh, pretty spectacular. Next. And then there's Eastern Washington, really a whole different place. Uh, it has big open areas to attract raptors. And uh, we get visitors both from the north, like Bohemian Waxwing, and from the high elevations. Great Crown Rosy Finches comes down to lower elevations in the winter to feed. So we get lots of visiting birds, raptors, and, and other birds that come to the big open areas in eastern Washington. A rough winged hawk, a rough legged hawk, excuse me, uh, is uh, you know, really common. Uh, on, a, on a typical winter, you'll see more rough legged hawks than you see red tailed hawks in the winter on a given day. So it, it can vary depending on where you're at, but you can see lots and lots of rough legged hawks easily. Next. Uh, Bohemian wax wings are always fun. Uh, I, I can't believe they get down to Florida. So that'd probably be a good bird for you guys. Uh, gray crowned rosy finches, of course, are always fun. Continue. Uh, white winged crossbills are always a, a exciting bird for us to see. We don't see many white winged crossbills. Red crossbills, most years are pretty abundant. This is not a good year for crossbills. So we haven't had many crossbills of either, uh, either species around in the last few months, but most winters you can get red crossbill easily and with work, get a white winged crossbill. Jeer falcon, again, uh, you can find one in Eastern Washington on any phone pole, just not most phone poles. They could be anywhere. They just kind of show up. They cover big areas. Continue. Uh, we have a lot of what we call fancy chickens. Some of them are introduced, like this chucker. Uh, we have gray partridge and ringneck pheasant as our other introduced, uh, and a wild turkey, I guess, introduced to Washington as our uh, other uh, fancy chickens. But we have uh, shop-tailed grouse. Uh, they're not easy to find and harder now that we've been really hammered by uh, wildfires the last few years, but uh, they are available in Eastern Washington in the right place if you're lucky. Continue. Uh, this is uh, the best picture I have of a gray partridge is in the talons of this golden eagle. This was a year or two ago on an Eastern Washington trip. Golden eagles are really fairly easy to find in Eastern Washington, uh, usually soaring, uh, but sometimes perched and always, always exciting to see a golden eagle. Continue. Uh, bald eagles, uh, again, they're found in eastern Washington also, although not nearly in the numbers around, that they are in western Washington around the salmon runs, but you always have to look eagles over carefully to see uh, which one they are when you're in eastern Washington. In western Washington, you know, you almost don't have to think about it because they're essentially all, never say all, but essentially all bald eagles. Uh, so when our friends tell us, I saw a golden eagle yesterday, you just don't argue with them, say, okay. Uh, rough, rough legged hawks, again, always fun. Just some, one of my favorite raptors, continue. Uh, and uh, we get the usual occipiters, coopers and sharp shinned hawks. Here's the coopers hawk, continue. Uh, and then we get the birds that come down from higher elevation. Uh, Townsend solitaire is a good example. In the summer, it's pretty easy to find a Townsend solitaire if you hike at high elevation or you go to places where they breed, they're, they'll sing and they're relatively easy to find. In the winter though, you can just see one anywhere. I mean, you never know. They could be in your backyard. They can be also in migration, but in the winter, they just can be literally anywhere. Uh, and uh, a lot of the ducks that are harder to, not necessarily elevational migrants, but we get canvas backs uh, both east and west in the winter. Continue. Uh, and in the big flocks of birds, we see gigantic flocks of birds in the winter. Most of the flocks are horned larks. We see flocks of, oh, I don't know, five, 10,000 horned larks, not uncommonly in Eastern Washington, but you wanna look through them carefully for snow buntings and Lapland long spurs and gray crowned rosy finches can be mixed up in the flocks of horned larks. We get shrikes, northern shrikes in the winter, loggerhead shrikes in the summer, 
in the fall and winter, you want to look carefully because there's a month or so overlap that we get either one continue. Uh, and uh, sometimes when you see a big flock of birds uh, that you think are going to be uh, horned larks, they'll turn out to be snow buntings like on the left or again, rosy finches like on the right. Continue. Uh, owls uh, are pretty easy to find in the winter in Washington, maybe easier than they are in the, in the breeding season. Uh, Long-eared owls, if you know where there's a roost, you can usually go find one. Snowy owls, they're not common, but they're scattered around mostly eastern Washington, but sometimes on the Skagit Flats or this bird uh, spent a winter in Seattle on, on rooftops feeding on eastern gray squirrels, helped with our squirrel control for winter. Uh, next. Uh, small owls, we had saw wet and, and uh, northern pygmy owl. Northern pygmy owl on the left, you see just anywhere in eastern Washington. You just drive and drive and drive and then you see a pygmy owl. Uh, saw wet owls, on the other hand, you need to know which tree they're going to be in. They have preferred roosts, and we go to the same tree winter after winter and see uh, a saw wet owl just like this. This picture was taken with a cell phone. They're just incredibly tame. You walk right up under them in the daytime and take a picture. So let's continue. Uh, Nia Bay, I'm just going to put in a, a pitch for Nia Bay. Uh, it's really more of an attraction for state birders because we get vagrants. Nia Bay, if you look at the, the position, uh, it way up at the northwest tip of the Olympic Peninsula. On the left of the picture, you see a mountain range in the middle of the Olympic Peninsula. That's the Olympic Mountains. And way up at the tip uh, is Nia Bay. And it is a fabulous vagrant trap. Uh, it, it catches migrants, probably migrants coming south. It gets uh, vagrants from uh, vagrants coming up from the south. Uh, birds tend to congregate there like they do on a lot of peninsulas, but here they seem to stick around and we get fabulous uh, migrants here. Next slide. Uh, I didn't put pictures of many of them, but uh, palm warbler and tropical kingbird are seen every fall in Nia Bay. Palm warbler is sometimes in good numbers and you might get three or four tropical kingbirds. The, the kind of weird thing about kingbirds in the state is up until August, all of the kingbirds are Western kingbirds. They're just pretty common in Eastern Washington. They're really common in Western Washington. They're a not uncommon vagrant or migrant, uh, but in come late September, October, they're all gone. You just never ever see a Western kingbird that late here, but we commonly are occasionally see tropical kingbirds. And Nia Bay seems to be a place they go to. They get screwed up, they go north instead of wherever they're supposed to be going, and they hit the end of the Olympic Peninsula and they just hang out in Nia Bay. So we get them there. Continue. This is just a, a couple pages of list of birds that have been seen at Nia Bay. Just some crazy birds. We have Crested Karakara, Eurasian Hobby. One of the birding spectacles that I saw was not the Eurasian hobby, but the 110 or 120 spotting scopes lined up on a dirt road in Nia Bay one day, uh, looking at the Eurasian hobby. People came from all over the country to see that bird. It was pretty cool. Uh, Red-legged kittiwakes are easier to find there than anywhere else in the state. Uh, and just zone-tailed hawk showed up there a few years ago. Continue. And again, a uh, Eurasian skylark has been there the last couple of winters on, a, on uh, Hoboc Beach. Uh, just a brambling's been down near that this winter. Just literally anything weird can show up at Nia Bay. Continue. And for Birders Sedona, Nia Bay is part of the Macaw Indian Reservation. And it was closed for a couple of years due to COVID, but it's back open again. You, if you go to Nia Bay, you just need to buy a, a year pass. You can get a pass at the, I don't know, it's not a 7-Eleven, but a little, uh, convenience store in town, there's only one, you go there and buy a pass from the tribe for $10 and you can bird there for a year. Uh, so continue. So uh, if you wanna to come to East Birding in Washington, any time of year, uh, there's a terrific guide. It's free on the WAS or Washington Law Ecological Society website called a guide to Washington birds. You can also get it in, in print and it outlines every area, almost all the good trips in the state are listed there because uh, eBird can help. And if you want a guide, we've got at least two professional guides. Con Tran uh, is our owl whisperer. If you want to see a great gray owl estate, just hire Con. He'll show you one. Nobody else can find them. And then Stefan Schluck 
is also, both of those guys are from Portland, interestingly, but they uh, run trips through the Okanagan and through Eastern Washington pretty regularly. So uh, that's uh, sort of it. So if you have questions, I'm open. That was wonderful. It's really cool to learn about the different different birds out there. Yeah, you can probably lose the screen share. Okay. Stop share. Okay, did, did anyone uh, have questions or have any things they were wondering about? When can we go? <laughs> I think uh, there are lots of hotels around. It's uh, not hard. You know, the, the time people come to Washington birding are typically the fall, uh, spring and fall, like everywhere else. But fall is really good here. Uh, uh, we have abundant uh, migrants. Uh, sure birding can be great. Uh, and uh, but it isn't like Eastern, Eastern birding where you come to see 20 species of warbler, not happening here. We just don't get uh, the, the warblers and the, uh, the big diversity of passerines you guys get. So Ethan has a question. Yeah. You had seven days to bird in Washington. Where would you recommend going? Well, what time of year are we talking about? Um, summer. In, in the summer? I would not come to Washington in July, okay? Just don't do it. There's nothing happening in the middle of the summer. Uh, but spring or fall, uh, if I was going to do a trip in the spring, uh, I would definitely spend a day or two at the coast. Uh, and by the coast, I mean the Grays Harbor Central Coast, uh, Westport, Aberdeen, uh, Ocean Shores, the coast. Uh, and if you wanted to do that, anywhere from the fourth week in April to the second week in May would be great for shorebirds. Uh, and so you don't, would definitely want to go to the coast. If you could link it up with a pelagic trip, that would be great. Westport Pelagic runs terrific pelagic trips. They are extraordinary. Uh, so I would, uh, I would, you know, definitely go uh, on a pelagic trip anytime you can get out of, out of Westport. Uh, then you would probably want to go to the mountains. Uh, and uh, there are several hikes out of uh, Sunrise at Mount Rainier that are terrific. Uh, so you'd probably want to spend a day or two there. And then you'd want to spend a couple of days in Eastern Washington. And depending on what your targets are, uh, you, you, you know, a Washington bird would go up to the Northeast corner, but an East Coast bird wouldn't because we go up to the Northeast corner to see the birds you see all the time on the East Coast. So that probably wouldn't be that exciting for you. A little, little snippet of the boreal forest comes down into the very Northeast corner of Washington. So we get, uh, you know, birds that you guys would, you'd better to go to New York or Maine or somewhere to see those birds for you guys. But uh, you'd probably want to spend a couple of days in, in Eastern Washington. Right. That'd be sort of how you'd spend the trip. And, and it's not that crazy a drive. To, from Seattle to the coast is two and a half hours drive. And from Seattle to Eastern Washington, it's only a couple of hours to go over the mountains. So it's all doable. Thank you. Laura was asking, okay, so on the East Coast, New York, the Christmas bird count, um, they were saying that the usual number of birds is much lower, possibly climate change, and possibly that it's taking longer for them to come down. Did you have that same experience in Washington State? Boy, I did three bird counts this year. I mean, we don't have the official results of all the bird counts in yet, so you know, I, I can't comment on everybody's bird count. Uh, I did three bird counts, and I thought that in general, um, uh, maybe a little less, but there's so much variation year to year in bird counts that it depends on weather, depends on timing, so many things. I, I think rather than try to make, uh, hypotheses from the results of a bird count, the bird counts have a purpose. They're at a fixed population over time. Look at the 10 year moving averages and make your conclusions from that, as opposed to sort of anecdotal. I'm a family doctor. I try not to base my, uh, 
police on anecdotes. So. <laughs> and Mary and Lori both said, thank you very much. Oh, con gusto. Um, and I wanted to point out when I was out there and not even doing much birding, but just going running around with my son, we did see long-billed curlews mm -hmm. on the beach also with the black oyster catchers in May. Yeah, but, that's the time. Uh, they're my, you know, the ones you, the curlews you saw in May are possibly first year birds that aren't going to breed. Big birds like that often don't breed in their first, uh, in their first cycle. Uh, and some of them spend the summer at the coast. Uh, curlews breed in eastern Washington on the big in the prairies. Uh, mm -hmm. So they weren't breeding at the coast. Uh, but often we'll have some oversummering birds. Uh, and they could have been still a migration, but usually they're breeding by May. So it's probably for cycle birds that were oversummering. Yeah. And bl black turnstones, yeah. Uh, black, yeah, black oyster catcher black shows oyster catcher. in the right yeah. place. Yeah. yeah, you're lucky to Same see those. They're, they're not all yeah. over the place. Oh, and Kathy wants to know, when is the best time to go on a pelagic trip in Washington state? Boy, that it, it depends. If you just want to see the biggest variety of species, okay, probably August, late August is a great time to go. Uh, if you want to see the rare stuff, uh, May, March, April is a great time to go, or later in the fall is a great time to go. Uh, but... You know, the problem with planning pelagic trips is they don't always go. Even a, a August 20th, let's say, pelagic trip could be canceled for weather. Uh, it, you know, to get on a pelagic trip out of Westport, you have to get across the bar, which is the area right at the mouth of the harbor, Westport, to get into Westport, I don't know, it's called Harbor, Grace Harbor. Uh, you have to get across the bar, and there are times when the boat can't make it. The, the swells are too high and it just just can't can't get out. And the skipper will just say, sorry guys, we can't go. And usually he knows the day before, but I've been on the boat at six o'clock and we sat there and he said, sorry, can't do it today. And I've also unfortunately been on it when we've plowed into the, plowed into the swells for an hour and not made any headway and he's turned around and said, we can't make it. So uh, the problem with plan planning pelagic trips here is that Unlike, you know, the plaid trips out of out of North Carolina, where they run, you know, 10 days in a row, or you can go and schedule five trips in, in six days or something. It isn't like that here. They do 30 trips a year, 20 or 30 trips a year, and maybe spend two in a weekend on a good weekend. And they'll usually, if they cancel on Saturday, they'll usually do it on Sunday, or if it's canceled on Sunday, they'll usually do it on Monday. But you have a chance of coming out here for a plaid trip and not getting offshore. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. It's and it can seem like that's a beautiful day. How can it be a problem? It has to do with the height of the swells. Maybe a storm three days ago caused big swells and even looked like a beautiful day. It's not a good day. So, you know, I, I would be reluctant to schedule a trip centered around just a pelagic trip here because it could be a big waste of money. Interesting. <laughs> Where specifically would you look for shorebirds along the coast? Oh, Grace Harbor is the place uh, around uh, Grace Harbor. If you, if I don't know, if, if you remember that map, uh, I don't know if it probably showed on it. But anyway, Grace Harbor is uh, mm -hmm. a big harbor. It's a fabulous uh, shorebird place. It's one of the major West Coast uh, layovers for birds. You know, the West Coast is a place in California, and then they come up to. Uh, here it is. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, if you look down the West Coast, you see the little, I guess it's sort of a heart-shaped harbor there. Yeah, part, no, there you go. That's uh, Grace Harbor. And on the on the end edges, it's a big harbor that's very shallow. And so there's a huge tidal action. You know, thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of mud open up and then get covered up. Uh, and there are two or three places, especially Bottle Beach near Westport, that you can go to that just crowd all the birds in as high tide approaches. So get there uh, when the tides are going to be about six and a half or seven feet and wait a couple of hours. And sometimes gigantic, gigantic numbers of birds will be will just come right to you. Just wait and the tide comes in and they'll just come in closer and closer and closer and closer until they all fly away. It's, it can be spectacular. Uh, so in the spring, 
towards the very end of April. Look at your tide tables and find find the right uh, right time to come. You want a day when there's a, a nice high tide during daylight hours uh, in that last week of April, first week in May. That's when you want to be here. And in the fall, is it still okay? Yeah, the fall is great. You don't see the, you know, you know, it's like shorebirding everywhere. In the spring, they come rushing up in huge numbers and there's a great congregation. But in the fall, uh, we it's better shorebirding if you want unusual species here in the fall. Uh, but that runs from the end of July until the first of November. Kind of all spread out, uh, looking for unusual birds. And you don't see the vast flocks of sherbet. You see nice, nice bunches of sherbets, but not huge you know, spectacles. Mm -hmm. And we're the coast, pretty much. Eastern Washington certainly has good sherberting, but again, it's it's central flyway sort of birds that veer out here. We get a few uh, a few uh, buff breasted, uh, excuse me, we get a rare buff breasted, we get a few pectoral sandpipers and a few uh, beard sandpipers and a few American golden plovers and things that uh, I think of as central flyway birds that wander out into eastern Washington. Uh, and, and on the coast, we get an occasional Pacific golden plover and some, some things. And then late in the fall, we get the Asian juvenile rarities. We get, you know, hmm. Uh, rough and things like that. While I have the map, is there anything else I should point to for everybody? Uh, well, you see the Puget Sound, that just morass of water that comes down into the uh, central part of Western Washington. At the very southern tip of that is Olympia, the state capital. <laughs> and then you see the San Juan Islands up in the, uh, up in the bay there. Yeah, San Juan Islands. San Juans are a great place to go. Not so great for birding, but you see, you know, orcas there are commonly seen, and uh, it can be really good for just a beautiful place to visit. Uh, uh, I think, and of course, the Cascades run down through the central Washington, the big, the big mountain there, and the next one up. I think that's, I think that's, uh, that's Mount Rainier on the top you pointed at, and down below is Mount St. Helens. Doesn't show the top blown off it, but that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Are there uh, national wildlife refuges out here? There are lots of governmental lands. Uh, I don't know if there. I think I don't. I can't think of any of them that are true national wildlife refuges. But there are huge areas of public lands. Yes, that you can bird on. Uh, if you look way down at the mountain range in the southeast corner, uh, that is uh, the blue, blues, the blues and the steens, uh, and that is fabulous. So you can go there, and it's just wonderful, wonderful place. And we're going down this coming weekend. Some friends and I are going down to uh, Asotan County, Columbia County, Garfield County, down in that corner, uh, and uh, see what we can find. You know, nobody's been there yet this year, <laughs> essentially. So. We'll see what we get. Uh, the word is there's not much snow cover right now, which makes it, uh, which I can't, it's hard to imagine with all of the rain and snow we've had in Western Washington, how can they not have snow out there? But that's what they tell us, and which makes it harder birding. If, when there's good snow cover, the birds tend to congregate in flocks where they can feed better. When there's not much snow cover, they're all spread out and harder to find. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, Check out the WASP.org, Washington Ornithological Society.org, WASP.org website for the Birding Washington under resources. I think there's something called Birding Washington. And it has the entire, uh, it has the entire uh, book. It's a you know 600 page book and it's all kept up to date. The instructions on how to find things. People will go there and say, oh gosh, that road's blocked and it keeps it current. So it's a really great resource. Yeah, you know, the book is always out of date, but the online version is more like more likely to not be out of date. I, don't know if I can say it's never out of date. I'm just curious about Mount St. Helens. I know it's been a long time since it erupted, but mm -hmm. have the, the the bird life recovered there or what? Largely, it it is a spectacular place. If you go to Mount St. Helens, they they have a couple of uh, tourist centers or whatever that you can see, and there are roads you can drive on. Uh, and it, it is just amazing. 
Uh, they kept it as a monument. They didn't harvest the blown down timber. Uh, and so not as much now as years ago, but still now you can look and for miles and miles and miles, every tree is just blown down in the same direction. So they just lined up, you know, miles and miles and miles of, of forest of the trees all just blown down it, in from one giant explosion, all, all in the same direction. And so you just see masses of blown down timber. Uh, it's pretty crazy. Wow. Yeah, it's it's really fun to visit. Uh, maybe not the hottest place to go birding. I mean, it's it's I'm sure it's good birding, but it's not a place that I think of as, boy, I want to go birding at Mount St. Helens. Okay. And you have to have reservations to hike there. It's yeah. very popular. So if you want to, it, Mount St. Helens is not a hard climb as mountain climbing goes. It's a long, a real long day hike, but people do it. And, but you have to schedule it like a year and a half in advance because they limit how many people can go. Hmm. Very interesting. Oh. Hmm. Well, I recommend the Bird Bander podcast episode with your own Deborah Green. Uh, <laughs> hear her story. Uh, she, it was fun talking with you, Deborah. I really appreciated it. And uh, how did your festival go? It went great. We had a good, good. turnout, over 300 people, and um, pe people seemed to really enjoy it. Very nice. Good. Good. I'm you glad. Listening. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good weather. So, yeah, everyone, check out Ed's um, podcast. It's something fun to listen to, like when you're driving to your birding destinations or to work or whatever. He does great interviews. You'll, he, he's done, um, you know, stuff about Florida too. So you'll. Enjoy I have. It. I've had this. The Simpsons. Does that sound right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. David? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, actually, David uh, was a guide on our festival. Oh yes. nice. I had the Simpsons and I had the McQuaids on some time yeah. ago. Oh, okay. I remember listening to that. That was excellent. I, I didn't know much about them. And that I remember being so impressed with their high speed pelagic bird. Yeah, <laughs> like we were the talking about thing. how they how they yeah they have some kind of radar or something on the boat. Use, uh, use radar to chase birds down. So um, on your uh, Antarctica trip, did you get to meet uh, Gina and Adam Kent? How many people were on that anyway? There were 180 guests. Oh. And I had COVID for five days, unfortunately. Uh, a whole bunch of us on the boat got COVID, which was really a drag. Uh, fortunately, nobody got desperately ill. It was not, it was just an inconvenience. I missed all of South Georgia. Didn't even get to go ashore. So I missed all the giant king penguin colonies and the South Georgia Pippet and that sort of thing. I was in quarantine in my room for five days during that. Uh, so that was kind of a drag, but overall terrific trip. And I'm, I'm sure I met them. Uh, I met almost everyone on the boat, but I don't remember. Mm -hmm. it, part of the people were just tourists and part were birders? No, it was all birders. There were several boats. I'm not sure I was on the same boat as they were, but I might well have been. Uh, but this was a, a boat put together by Rock Jumper Birding, the South African company, and the American Birding Association, and Alvaro's Adventures, our, uh, Alvaro Jaramillo's group, put together a boat full of birders. So it's all birders, with the exception of some wildlife photographers that were also on the trip. So it was a bird-focused trip. You know, the, the deck was just covered with pelagic birders all from dawn to dusk. It was great. Hmm. Wonderful. Great. And listen to his podcast about that too. <laughs> yeah. I also, my latest episode was with uh, George Armistead and we talk about that a little bit too. So yeah. that was fun. Definitely lots to check out. That's what I love about doing this podcast. I get to listen to really fun people. I mean, it gives me license to talk to people that otherwise, why would they talk to me? You know? So it's good. <laughs> no, you do good. Yeah, really good. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for having me. Nice to see you. Uh, you can reach out to me if you want to on the contact uh, page on the birdbanner.com website. I'm easy to find. Uh, and thanks for having me. You have a good day. You too. Right. Thank, thank you, you for coming. Wonderful presentation. Bye-bye. Thank you.